Welcome to the Midwest Education Technology Communities Podcast, otherwise known as METC. METC is a nonprofit organization based out of St. Louis, Missouri, with a mission to motivate, engage, transform, and connect all learners to advocacy, partnerships, and professional learning opportunities. METC is a premier affiliate of ISTE. To learn more about METC, follow us on social media at METC Ed Plus. You may also check out our website at METCEdPlus.org. METC is a program of Education Plus. To learn more about Education Plus, go to edplus.org. It is now time to begin our current episode. We thank you for listening and enjoy the learning. Welcome to another episode of the METC Podcast. This is episode 56 and the final episode within the METC 19 Spotlight Educator Series. My name is Jonathan Lee, your host. You can connect with me on Twitter at jleetechpercent. Vicki Miko is my guest today, and we have been battling the scheduling bug. It has been either my kids being sick or her voice going out, which obviously isn't good for a podcast. But we were able to get together and talk about the importance of cultivating curiosity recently. I'm excited to share this topic. I wholeheartedly believe that it is very important to keep our students curious and then to use this curiosity to drive engagement in learning the content, and I think that you will get a lot out of this episode. Before we begin, I wanted to remind you that we have our 36th annual METC conference coming up in just more than a week, depending on when you catch this episode. Just like the other Spotlight Educators, Vicki will be presenting all three days of the conference. Hopefully you are able to join us for either one, two, or all three days of this conference. It is going to be an amazing three days. There are going to be many different ways and opportunities to learn. I hope to see you there. All right, let's get into this episode of the podcast. This is my conversation with Vicki Miko of the Fox C6 School District talking about the importance of cultivating curiosity in the classroom for episode 56 of the METC podcast. Enjoy. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another METC podcast. Glad to have you here with us today. I have the final installment of the METC 19 Spotlight Series, and my guest today is Vicki Miko, and she is down in the Fox School District, and she's going to talk to us about cultivating curiosity. Welcome to the show there, Vicki. Hi. So glad you can make it. I know we've been playing phone tag and Twitter tag and dealing with a, a, a bad voice and my children being sick and everything. So I'm glad we were able to get you in and on the podcast. Yeah, this is going to be fun. Okay. I, I know it's going to be a lot of fun. So uh, before we get started into our topic of cur- uh, cultivating curiosity, can you tell everyone a little bit about yourself, please? Sure. So I am a my 16th year teaching and I teach gifted education and I teach regular STEM as well. And I teach in two buildings. I teach at the Fox Middle School and at Ridgewood Middle School for the Fox New Six School District. Awesome. So you say you teach gifted ed and? And regular STEM. So I have an elective that just anyone can take it if they want to take it. So you don't have to be a gifted kid to be in the class. Okay. Gotcha. How long have you been in that role? Have you you teach? Oh, um, for 14 years. So for 16, so I guess I started off for two years. I taught science. And then I moved into gifted, and then I picked up the STEM elective about six years ago. Awesome. Very cool. Uh, that sounds like a good mixture of topics there. And I bet that you t- touched on a lot of STEM stuff with your gifted ed kids before you got tacked on the, the STEM stuff before. Absolutely. Yeah. So that definitely helped it to develop that curriculum. Um, it's just a different pace, but it's a lot of the same materials. Cool. All right. Well, let's get into our topic and talk. So we're talking about curiosity and the, and the ability to actually cultivate it within the classroom. So let's, let's first help define what curiosity actually means before we get into it. What does that mean to be curious or curiosity? All right. So 
if you look that up, you're going to see that it says something along the lines of um, it's a strong desire to know where to learn something. And we want our kids to be lifelong learners. So we obviously want curious kids. You know, they start off in kindergarten, they have lots of questions. And when they get to middle school, they have fewer questions. So we want, they actually have lots of questions still, but they be, they're less likely to share that out of fear of how people are going to like anticipate their answers or how they think they're going to come across if someone thinks they're stupid. So they are less likely to share that. And so cultivating that curiosity in the classroom just means bringing back out that natural curiosity, that natural desire to learn something. And I imagine that would help engage them into the topic or content that they're learning if they have, if they're curious about it. Absolutely. So yeah, the more curious you are about something, the more likely that you're going to want to learn and dive in more to what you're doing, whether that be STEM or language arts, any of the classes. Gotcha. And so we are, um, when we talk about our curiosity, how you are cultivating it within your classes and your schools, we're going to really kind of take a, a STEM focus to it, I believe, based off of our content that we have here. Um, and so we're talking about some coding and some AR, VR stuff. So uh, you say you teach gifted ed and you teach STEM. What would you say is your current skill level of stuff like coding? Are you a good, are you a coder? Are, are you an AR, VR expert? Uh, what, how, what is your skill level with those things? Okay, so I would say my current level is much higher than it was when I got started, but I'm definitely not an expert. There is no way I could even be considered an expert in any of those fields. I, I, can, I know more than the kids do sometimes, but there's often times that they'll come back and they'll be able to figure something out much faster. And when I first got started with coding, I was maybe like a week ahead of them um, as far as, you know, how much more I knew than the kids did. I I'm going to prepare a little bit and know how to log everyone in. And then after that, it was, uh, they were, they were catching up pretty fast to me and then passing me right up with how, like how they were able to build and create encoding and AR, especially with AR last year, it was brand new. So, you know, I didn't, I didn't hardly know anything when we first started that. I was learning right along with the kids. So that, that to me sounds a little scary. Uh, I guess, but I think, I think when they see that you are embracing being a beginner and you don't have all the answers, the kids don't really mind that as much as you would think. They don't think I'm stupid. They don't, they, they still look to me for some answers, but I'm more the person that says, well, let's see where we can find that answer. I don't know it, but I can help you find it. Like let's do some Google searches. Let's really define what we're looking for. And that's something kids have trouble with. So I still have wisdom. I'm still like, in charge. It's just the fact that they aren't looking necessarily for that content. Like they're, they know that they probably can figure it out and they're actually able to find stuff on their own, which is better because you're teaching them to fish versus just giving them the fish. So applicable to lots of things. Very true. Very true. So I, I think you've hit on a couple good uh, points there that you didn't come out right out and say, and I want to go ahead and make sure we highlight those for, for those listening that, um, one, I, I think that the relationship piece you have between you and your students is huge. Um, that they are looking to you as almost a role model and, and how to react and learn, right? Because you're showing and demonstrating for them that you too are curious. You too are also learning about this topic and that you're going to make mistakes and you're going to make them right in front of them and that's okay. Uh, and so then that then turns around for the kids to realize, you know what? if my teacher can make mistakes, then I can make mistakes. And so that brings that climate piece into your classes that makes it a safe spot to have that curiosity cultivated. And so I think that's huge. And you were talking about it, but you didn't have to because it's so organic within what you're doing. I think it's pretty cool. Thanks. Yeah. That was a good way of putting it. Well, I mean, it's, it, yeah, it, it's something that, you know, I think back to my classes and um, it's not something that I really noticed because it was just natural for me to have that relationship. I was able to sit there and, and have um, a learning relationship with my students and it took my evaluation for the principal to come in and say, you know what, you, your climate and culture within your classroom is, is amazing because you can do things and the kids are just you know, watching you. And so it's not something that if it's happening naturally, it's in the teachers 
we're just used to it, right? It's not a big deal. Um, but it is a big deal. And that's what some classes are missing and why when we say, oh, you can do this, you can cultivate curiosity. They go, no, 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 I can't. And it really comes back to that climate and relationship piece. But anyway, I love the idea that you're not scared to learn and that you're being curious with your kids. That's such a great way to do what it is you're doing. Well, thanks. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, I'm done giving you compliments. Let's get on to the next question. So knowing all of that, right? Um, you talked about how you knew a week in advance. You're a week ahead of what your kids knew. Sometimes your kids will pass you. I guess what's scary to teachers, and it would be scary to me too, is how do you, we like to be, we're planners, right? We plan weeks, months, maybe if you're really good, um, maybe just a day ahead, um, what we're going to teach, how we're going to teach it. How do you plan for something if you don't know how to do, to do it? If you don't know AR, I don't know coding, how do you make those plans? Well, several things. First of all, um, Twitter is, is probably one of the best secrets in education. It, it shouldn't be a secret, um, but you can look on Twitter and see how other people have used different tools. And then the other thing is, you know, if a like guy noticed when I first started doing AR, I wanted to do something with creativity. I wanted them building something and I wanted it to be a good hook. I didn't know how to use metaverse. For instance, I saw it on Twitter. I saw that it was AR that you create yourself. And I just hopped on and I said, well, let's see what it does. And I watched like maybe five YouTube videos and saw how they created things. And then I pulled some kids over and I said, hey, does this look like something you'd want to do? We were looking to do a creative writing piece. And would this be something like a product that you guys would want to do? And, and they kind of messed with it for a couple of minutes. They were pulling different, different experiences together and very basic ones. And they put, popped up the phone and the minute that their experience came to life, they were, they were hooked. They said, oh my gosh, this works like on my phone right in front of me. And because they were so excited about it, it makes you as a teacher want to learn a little bit more plan for that. And so from there, because I'd never made an experience other than just very basic ones on Metaverse, I thought, okay, so what would a good Metaverse look like? And I involved the students and we talked about well, um, it might be a trivia game or it might be, it might be a, a, a creative writing piece like a choose your adventure story. And what would a good one look like? And we kind of made some guidelines as to what we thought would make, make a good one. And from that, the students were able to start building their own experiences. So when I start planning, it's really it comes down to some of the things are just what's popular right now? What are kids into? What are, what will hook them to want to write? Um, because some of the kids, you know, obviously could write novels and other kids don't want to write two sentences. So if I have something that they'll want to sit and write like 80, 80 pages of, of experiences on your phone, then, and they're happy to do it, then I'll, I'll sit and learn about it. <laughs> so <laughs> I think that's, um, I, I try to figure out what, and, and I, my class is a little different because it is an elective. So I'm not held to, you know, like we have to get through integers by March. You know, I, I'm, I don't have that timeline that other teachers are held to. So I'm able to have that little bit more flexibility to ask kids and, and decide what are we going to learn about. No, I mean, and that, that all makes sense. But I also think that um, even, I mean, don't sell yourself short, even though you don't have – the timelines or the, you know, the, I think that you're hitting on some good points and um, it comes down to, it's not, you're not worried about the tool. Yeah. You're going to use metaverse or you're going to use some kind of scratch or whatever. That may be the tool in that you're using, but the content is still the focus. So uh, right. you're using the curiosity of how metaverse works to help them learn more about and show the demonstrating understanding of whether it is a writing piece or whether it is a book or a, math concept like integers, how can they display that within a program like Metaverse or Scratch, that kind of thing. And so the, the tool is not necessarily have, what you have to worry about. Um, it's the content. And we can plan content, right? We can, I, I mean, we can, right. we can content things so, out like crazy. Right. Like we were planning on doing a creative writing piece no matter what. So how are we going to do that? And just like we did our creative writing piece this year, and it was scary stories, you know, 
I didn't make them all do podcasts, but that was one of the avenues kids could choose. And so the content was, you know, the fact that they were writing a, a good, scary story. What are the good, what are elements of good, scary writing? And then from there, how are you going to demonstrate good, scary stories? And you're choosing that avenue. So yeah, it really isn't, it doesn't come down to the tool at all. It comes down to what is the overall content that you want. But I do use those tools as a good hook to get, um, to get better quality out of the kids. Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. So I think that's that's something that the teachers really need to. I think here again that that don't let the tools slow you down. The tools that's where the curiosity is going to come from. That's where what's going to drive their ability to learn the content. And um, you can, we can continue to work on and worry about the content because that's what we are good at. That's why we are there, right? And let right. the curiosity from the the tools help drive that content learning. And so that's cool. So um, you've, you've mentioned a couple items like uh, metaverse and I know you got some other items that you want to share. So how are you cultivating curiosity within your classrooms? What kind of tools are you using to go with that content? Well, every year we use a lot of cardboard. I'm not going to lie. A lot of cardboard. <laughs> uh, so in the past we've done things like uh, cardboard arcade. And the reason why cardboard it really works well with curiosity is because my favorite phrases, students will say, oh, this is real math. They're, they're reaching, so do you have a protractor? Do you have, I how do you measure this angle? And you're showing them, they're like, oh, I did that in my math book, but now this is real math. <laughs> so, um, and I think cardboard is uh, something that we utilize a lot to cultivate curiosity because it's pretty inexpensive and a lot of duct tape. So um, projects in the past have been, like I said, a cardboard arcade. Uh, we recently just did cardboard boats. So the kids had to develop their, they had to build a boat on site. So they, like we went to Jefferson College, they built their boats that they were going to get in and paddle across the, the pool at Jefferson College. And then, uh, but they built it all within like two hours had lunch, raced our boats, and we did that with 170 kids. So wow. uh, even just coming up with the idea of how to, how to get 170 kids all building boats in two hours took planning. And, uh, and I definitely asked my students from the previous year, like, for ideas. What do you think? How do we do this? So that is something. I, they have Another thing is that I do ask their opinions. They do have buy-in in the class. So cardboard boats is one of them. You went on to talk about those um, cardboard boats, which sounds amazing. I know that you probably have some video of that that's pretty cool and pictures and stuff like that. Can you expand more about your cardboard arcade? Because I think that has like other tools that you're using that's kind of embedded into that whole thing. Right. So we did a cardboard arcade that, that was three years ago. And we utilized Mickey Mickey's and circuits and lights and they had to build these giant arcade games um, out of cardboard and what I loved was you know a student asked well what if this doesn't work right how's that going to affect my grade and I said you know I think the bigger picture is you know we're going to have like the whole school's invited to come play with these you know do you care what the grade is or do you care that people are going to think your your skee-ball is amazing and he was like, oh, I definitely care more, more, way more about what they think. <laughs> so, um, you know, the grade part of, of a classroom, I think also just like helps focus if it's a curious classroom or not. You know, if kids are more focused on the learning than the grade, I think that also uh, helps. Awesome. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you there. Uh, do you have any students do any kind of podcasting? We did, yeah. So this past, this past September, uh, we started our scary story unit. I had never done any podcasting, but like this is my first one to be on, Ooh, <laughs> and yay. and I uh, I was really the party. In fact, I didn't even listen to podcasts. Like it was not a thing. I was just like, okay, that's what other people do. And <laughs> uh, now you're a guest on one. All right. <laughs> yeah, JQ Presidento is our educational technology specialist, and he also does a podcast. Fits and bites of education. And, you know, I saw him posting about it and 
I thought, you know, that seems like something that would be really cool for a scary story. And in the past, you know, I've had kids, they write their stories, we go out in the woods and we tell them around a, around a campfire and uh, at nighttime and they roast s'mores and it's a great time. And then I used to put them in a book and it was time consuming and it was expensive and they were just kind of stuck in this book. They had no life to them. If you didn't buy the book, you know, you would never know there was a story. So I came the idea of podcast. And I said, this is something I think would be cool because they, we listen to some scary story podcasts and the kids all got excited because, you know, you could make it almost like a play. Like there's like reader's theater type podcasts. And so the kids were all helping each other, you know, fill the different parts of their stories and telling them in different voices and adding music and sound effects. And then they were publishing these podcasts. So that gave them a genuine audience to want to do better because it wasn't just going to be like a little group that was in our, in our class. And it wasn't just uh, the people sitting around the campfire. It was going to be this whole wider audience that could hear their story. And so just having that, that bigger audience really up their game a lot. And, uh, and like I said, I didn't know the first thing about podcasts. So we had to have JT come in and teach us uh, all about Anchor and, and how to use it. So it was a pretty fun experience. I have to say the kids really enjoyed it. Yeah, that's awesome. It sounds like a lot of fun. I, I know that uh, good old JP has that podcast. He also is a co-host on another podcast with me uh, at tech pod squad. And so, um, yeah, we do a lot of work together. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, I do remember back when I was in the classroom, we did a, um, it wasn't scary stories unit, but it was like fictional writing. Um, no, it was per- sorry. It was personal narrative, and we had a big story night where we had parents come in and we videotaped them and we recorded the audio and all that stuff like that. It was kind of before podcasts really kind of blew back up per se. But you know, just the fact that I was recording them, I don't know. I think we just ended up kind of sharing them with the parents. We didn't really put it out on a website because Anchor wasn't around back then. And I'm not sure if like the other ones like Podbean that we use now was around back then. But of course, we're talking eight years ago or so. Uh, right. But, you know, just just the idea of having them recorded, and I told them, oh, we're going to have other people listen to this, um, really stepped up their game. And the way they it, it put a lot more voice into their writing, which I thought I found really amazing because they kind of they fed off of the idea that other people were going to hear it. They wanted it to be kind of, you know, uh, a, a big deal. So I thought that was really cool. So I think adding that option into a way for students to kind of get their story out there is a, is a, is a neat idea. Let's move on to um, moving beyond the classroom, right? So are you able to provide any opportunities for your students to kind of showcase their work beyond? You talked about that boat thing and you, the kids building the boat with duct tape and cardboard and out and going across the lake. So obviously that had to be outside the classroom. Um, what other opportunities are you getting your students to kind of showcase their work to, for other people? Right. So I have about 14 eighth graders are going to be coming to METC, the convention in I guess, February 12th, and they're going to be sharing uh, in this Junior Innovation Showcase. They're going to be sharing about different projects they've done, ones that we're talking about right now they're going to be sharing, and what's nice is I basically told them about it, and then they immediately started brainstorming, and they took it on. It was their their thing. It's not an extra thing for me to do, (laughs) so they had completely decided this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to show it. This is, this is how we're going to do something interactive with the people with us. And in fact, they decided, well, it's a tech conference, so we don't want paper handouts and stuff. So we're going to, they made a website and one person started making a website and compiling all the different rubrics and papers that go with the different ones, different activities that we did. So that way, teachers could like see it later like they you know sometimes you go to those innovation things or you walk past a booth you know you're like that was a great idea and you don't remember you don't take it with you or it gets lost in your backpack if it's like a piece of paper but if you had that website you're like, oh yeah I could go back to that and see pictures from the event and see the rubrics and the the activity guides that went with it and just so but I, I didn't do any of it it's the kids so it's pretty cool because they're by the time they're eighth graders, they're they're pretty self sufficient. It's pretty awesome. I um, love that. Yeah, that's that's that is super awesome. I am I am so excited about the showcase itself and to hear that your kids just kind of took over and 
to, to care of that for you. I, you know, so many teachers that I talk to and say, I, you should bring some kids to our innovation showcase. And like, well, I don't know if we have time for this. And we don't, it, it's so much more work, it, but it's really not. Um, give your students that curiosity, give your students that voice and let them run with it. They will take over. You just provide the content in which they're going to learn and um, you can make it happen. So I'm excited to have your kids up there with us uh, on the February 12th. And so, um, you know, it's a great way for them to get, we have, uh, I think about 1200 people, 1400 people registered for Tuesday alone. And so to have that many teachers possibly come through and see their work and talk about their work, what a, I'm not sure of a better way to extend their learning. I mean, that, that's going to be a, a great event. So I'm excited about that. Yeah, they're pretty excited too. And I'm, I'm excited to share my kiddos because they really are amazing. So it'll be a good day for sure. Awesome. Yep. So, well, Vicki, believe it or not, we have come toward the end of our show. So I want to um, give you an opportunity to kind of give us some closing remarks and some, some tips and tricks. Hopefully you've, you've uh, piqued the interest of some listeners here and you want, they now want to cultivate curiosity, right? We're getting toward spring break. And so once they get refreshed, from spring break or after METC conference, they get all these ideas. They're going to want to cultivate curiosity in their classroom. What are some ideas, tips, closing comments that you want to give them? So I think the biggest takeaway would be that a curious classroom, you're not pursuing a grade, but you're really pursuing, you know, answering questions and solving problems. And, you know, being less worried about how your grades affected and more inclined to take those risks and, really step outside your comfort zone for the students to do that. So um, if I want them to like try that hard stuff and I can't shut them down and nitpick every little thing, I have to, I have to bolster their efforts and be excited with, with their wins. In my class, I try to provide authentic opportunities to just uh, demonstrate what they know. And as far as that's concerned, uh, students care far less about their grade and really more about what the audience thinks about their work. So uh, one one final thing was recently we made giant cardboard trees and these were from these were like seven foot tall trees and they were all out of cardboard everything so save your Amazon Prime boxes everyone <laughs> because truly uh, cardboard is key I said okay let's do this we're gonna, they all wanted well it all stemmed from the fact they wanted to decorate my room but I can't just let them decorate the room they have to you know we have to use real math and real science and problem solving and you know, and we were practicing for this boat trip coming up, we decided, okay, I'm going to dedicate six class periods. You can make these giant trees and they got to pick their theme and they had to think about, okay, Mrs. Mick was inviting the whole school to come through and vote on their favorite trees. So the theme has to be something that other students and teachers would like. They have to be able to be all mo or mostly recycled materials and it has to be able to be finished in like six hours. So they had to use a lot of problem solving and, and lots, of, lots of compasses and lots of math <laughs> and <laughs> angles. Uh, it, was, it was pretty cool. And, and really, at the end of the day, it wasn't the grade they were worried about. It was really that ooze and ahs that they wanted from their peers when they came in and they saw all these cool trees that were hanging from the ceiling and, and you know, up from the floor. And they used all these different, you know, uh, cardboard folding techniques and the attachment techniques to make it all work. And, and yeah, they're, it was it was their hard work, and they were just so proud of themselves. And the last thing I did with that was I had a table where people could write, uh, you know, what like little little compliment cards, and the kids just sat there the next day reading those, and just loved the fact that students took time to say, "Hey, I really loved your Harry Potter tree. I love that you had the the letters hanging from the ceiling like they were flying flying around the room, and I loved that you." You know, I love the, the winter tree because it was just so beautiful and all the colors just went together so well. That was the feedback that was far more important. Uh, and they knew in order to get that kind of feedback, they had to have a good product. And so you work back from there. If I want a good product, I have to have a good plan. That, that's, how, that's how you do it. Um, how much, most how most importantly, that? just letting kids, uh, letting kids have a little bit more voice, I think, is also a a big part of a curious classroom. Absolutely. Yeah. Th that sounds like so much fun. I mean, to all of a sudden to start decorating building trees, that's, that's, that's crazy. Yeah. So if you, if your recycling bin is anything like mine, 
uh, you can help cut down your recycling bin and bring all your cardboard into your classroom and start having them use real math and put that content to work uh, by building things um, and, and let them cultivate their own curiosity. That sounds very cool. So Vicki, uh, I want to thank you for being on our show. Before we uh, ended up here, I want to make sure that you give your information so people want to learn more about cultivating curiosity she is going to be at the mutc conference here in a couple weeks so you should definitely come and check out her show or her sessions and she's doing a workshop as well um but if they want to reach out to you whether it's twitter or email or anything what it, share anything you're willing to provide sure so they can contact me via email at school that's just miko m-i-k-o-w at foxy6.org or you can contact me at Twitter. Uh, when I got my Twitter handle, it was like 2010, and everyone was replacing letters and numbers and stuff. So, <laughs> so I'll spell it out for you. It's at Gifted Educator, but it's um, it's at Gifted and then E D U C H O R. So uh, for Twitter. So either one, you can get a hold of me. Awesome. Well, thank you again for taking the time to talk with us and be on the show and, and helping us understand the importance, uh, all the things that go into the importance of cultivating curiosity. It's greatly appreciated. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks. Are you cultivating curiosity within your classroom? What an easy way to hook your students into the content. Don't be afraid to learn new tools alongside your students. You know your content, and that will come through in the end. The tool will help the engagement of your students within the content. How are you using curiosity within your classroom? Share your ideas with us on Twitter. When you do, Use the hashtag METC Podcast. We recently received a fresh shipment of METC Podcast stickers. We are looking to share them out. If you share your ideas with us on Twitter, we will be glad to send some stickers your way as a thank you. Once again, I want to thank you for checking out our little show here. We are almost finished with our second full season. I have learned a lot and I hope that you have as well. Podcasts are a wonderful source of any time, anywhere professional development, and I am honored that you have chosen us to learn from. If you are enjoying the show, I would greatly appreciate feedback on iTunes or Google Play. Your feedback can help others locate our podcast. Remember, the goal of this podcast is to share the wonderful stories of the amazing things happening in our classrooms. So, the more people that learn about our podcast, the more that we share and reach our goal. Don't forget to check out the show notes at metcedplus.org. You can reach out and connect with me on Twitter at jleetechpercent. And until our next episode, have a good one, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Midwest Education Technology Communities Podcast, otherwise known as METC. To learn more about METC, check out our website at metcedplus.org or follow us on social media at METCEdPlus. To learn more about Education Plus, go to edplus.org.